From the University of Tulsa, this is Sacred and Profane Love, a podcast that explores how literature, philosophy, and theology can help us think more deeply about love, happiness, and meaning in human life. I am Jennifer Frey, Dean of the Honors College at TU and your host. I invite you to join me and my guests, which range from award-winning fiction writers, poets, and literary critics, to philosophers and scholars from a range of disciplines, as we explore in conversation how the enjoyment of art might be, as the late philosopher and novelist Iris Murdoch has so provocatively suggested, a training in the love of virtue. I hope these conversations will enrich your life, inspire you to crack open some good books, and bring your attention back to what ultimately matters in the end. I am very pleased to be joined this morning by Patrick Deneen. Patrick Deneen is professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. His teaching and writing interests focus on the history of political thought, American political thought, liberalism, conservatism, and constitutionalism. He has written many books, but his most famous books are his last two books, Why Liberalism Failed, which came out in 2018, and his latest book, Towards a Post Regime Change Towards a Post Liberal Future. Welcome to the podcast, Patrick. Thanks for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. Yeah, it's exciting. It's really exciting to have you back in Tulsa. I know last time you were here was 2005, so it's been a while. I think I was here for the diocese more recently, but the last time I think I was here for university was, yeah, going back a ways. That's true. I need to be more specific. The Mm -hmm. last time you were at the University of Tulsa. Yeah, so I'm glad to be back. Yeah, we're very glad to have you. Especially because it's 70 degrees here in, what are we, February? Which is, I'll tell you, in South Bend, it's not 70 degrees today. That's true. That's true. You got some nice Oklahoma weather. Mm -hmm. So that was lucky because, to be fair, and I, of course, am new to Oklahoma, it's not always Mm -hmm. nice this time of year. So a bit of luck. And I'm just glad for the sunshine. So we're here to talk about Don DeLillo's novel, White Noise, which is the novel that you chose for our conversation. Came out in 1985, won the National Book Award. Why White Noise? Why did you want to talk about this novel? White Noise came to mind because it's a book that I have always enjoyed first reading and then rereading, and it's been a little while since I've reread it, so I thought it, maybe it was about time to pick it off the shelf. How old were you when you first read it? It probably was around the time it came out, because I was in graduate school, so probably 87, 88, okay. around there. Yeah. yeah, and it struck you then in the 80s as... Yeah, so if the first thing that strikes, I think anyone who reads this book, and I don't know if your listeners will be familiar with the book, maybe some, it is an uproariously funny book. It is just a laugh out loud funny book. It's hilarious. The first time I read it was a bedtime on the bedstand book, and my wife was so annoyed at me. And every time I pick up this book, she's like, you're not going to read that in bed, are you? <laughs> because I would just wake her up startled in the middle of the night. Yeah, I mean, it's so quotable, right? I mean, there's so many times when you're reading it when you just want to turn to the person next to you and be like, I want to read this to you. Like, it's hilarious. And the other reason was I was beginning my life as an academic. I was in graduate school. So I was really caught up. And I still am a great fan of the academic novel. So I'm probably like a lot of academics. The genre of the academic novel often confirms some of our experiences as academics. And it often, let's say, exaggerates some of those Mm -hmm. qualities. And Mm -hmm. it makes for a wonderful dive into everyday experience that makes it a bit more fun than it actually is in real life. Yeah, it's a campus novel, but it's not just a campus no, novel. Not. It definitely transcends that genre it entirely. It's sort of a mashup between an existential novel, a campus novel, I would say even a novel of ideas. Yes. But it reads just like a black comedy yeah. where you're laughing, but you sort of feel bad for laughing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. sometimes. (laughs) it's very dark. Yeah, it is. But it's objectively funny and it's very spot on. And one thing that really struck me reading it is just how well it has held up. Yeah. Right. Because I thought, okay, I know this is a novel about consumerism in the Mm -hmm. 80s and technology and all the technology will be obsolete and irrelevant and the politics will be faded. And no, it actually struck me as completely 
apt. Yeah. And that was surprising for me, yeah. actually. No, I think it reads. So it's, the funny thing is when the novel came out, the apt quality of it, what people really were struck by was one of the central... I guess, things that happens. And this is a novel where not a lot happens in a way. It's about the dynamics of the characters and a lot of the things that go on around them. But there are some things that happen. And the big thing that happens is the toxic airborne event, as it comes to be called, Mm -hmm. a train collision in which gas leaks out and becomes this toxic airborne event, as it's eventually called, and the official effort to turn this into something tameable and understandable. And the book came out just around the time of the Bhopal gas leak that killed thousands of people. And mm-hmm. people were remarking at that time how almost creepily prophetic mm-hmm. the book was in that respect. And then just recently, a movie came out of the same title, White Noise, which I don't necessarily recommend. I recommend reading the book. Mm-hmm. But when the movie came out, that was when the train wreck and gas yeah, leak no, in Ohio, no. Palantine, mm-hmm. Ohio, occurred. So there was a similar sort of, wow, this is, again, very prophetic. So that's one aspect that people have often commented that this book seems prescient or timely. But I think you get to the parts of the book that really do seem even more timeless, or at least certainly in in respect to where we live, which touches on, of course, consumerism, but consumerism not just of material phenomena. That's certainly part of it. The supermarket plays a big role in this book. The supermarket does play a big role. It's very, very big. And the supermarket, as it's described by Murray, this really remarkable character who is a sort of friend, colleague, confidant of the main character, Jack Gladney, who describes it as a kind of Bazaar, B A Z A A R. Mm -hmm. A bazaar where you can, in a sense, get anything at any time from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's where all your needs are met. Right. So, in some ways, writ large, this book is about a world that is a bazaar, that anything and everything is constantly, in a sense, available to us. And I think this, in some ways, touches on why this book is called White Noise, because the quality of bazaar, the availability of everything, is always in the backdrop of this book. Mm -hmm. So it's especially in the form of television and radio, but it's also, think of the titles of the sections, right? Waves and Radiation is the first section of the book, and then The Airborne Toxic Event, which is Mm -hmm. the literal byproducts of insecticide settling in over this little town, the college town of Blacksmith. We don't know the state. And then the last section is called Dilarama, which is named for a drug, Dilar, which is supposed to at least relieve us of our fear of death. So everything can be turned into a kind of product or a market, including all of the stuff of the world that once would have been unavailable Mm -hmm. to people in this little town of Blacksmith. Now suddenly it's all constantly pervading the atmosphere of this town. One of the really funny features of this book is constantly they're just little snippets where Jack or Babette, his wife, or somebody will say, from the other room I heard on the television, and then there'll just be a random statement. Mm -hmm. You want to use the gold-colored brush to finish this particular palette. Mm -hmm. Kind of irrelevant, disconnected, Mm -hmm. just constant inundation of this kind of white noise of externality. Yeah. And I mean, I want to come back to whatever the connection is supposed to be between white noise and the supermarket and these larger themes about maybe capitalism and consumerism and things like this. But something that really struck me, because I loved reading this novel, and that was a bit of a surprise. I wasn't expecting to love this novel because the only DeLillo that I had previously read was Underworld, and I didn't even finish it. I just was like, wow, this is not the novel for me, so not the novelist for me. I mean, I think there are people who love DeLillo as the author, and then I think there are a lot of people like you and I who like this particular book. Right. That the genre as a whole isn't what attracts. So I've tried to read other, and I've read some other DeLillo novels, but none of them has done to me or attracted me and continue to attract me as White Noise. Yeah, no, I mean, immediately, and I wasn't able to, but the immediate thing that I wanted to do upon completing this novel was to read it again. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because I just felt like there was so much there. But something that really hit me in reading it was because the white noise, it is on some level just about the distractedness of the world that we live in, Mm -hmm. where we're just constantly bombarded by messages that are either meant to shape our desires or shape our minds or to colonize our will, but that it's totally just constant and incoherent and there's no unity and you just push it aside. 
white noise machines are the things that you put on so that small children can mm-hmm. go to sleep. <laughs> it's just there. But I was thinking it's so much louder now. Mm-hmm. Everything that he's noticing in 1985. And of course, now the technology of 1985 will strike us as quaint. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We will feel nostalgic for it with the internet and with our phones. I mean, mm-hmm. I have my phone on airplane mode. You put your phone away mm-hmm. because if we had not done that, I would get just mm-hmm. within this conversation, right. maybe 100, 150 notifications. Right. And why I'm not a dean. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but even if you weren't a dean, I get a lot. Even yeah. if you were just a mother of six, or even if you were just, I don't know, department chair, or whatever you were doing that had you involved in coordinating things, it's constant. Yeah. And the effects that this has without you really realizing it on the way that you experience the world, but also just your ability to pay attention. Mm-hmm. It's just steadily obliterated. So that's why the novel was really powerful for me. I want to talk about the main characters, though, or at least some of them. So maybe one thing before we talk about the characters and some of the events, maybe just a few words about the novel, because I'm not assuming your listeners have read it. So the the novel is set in this town of Blacksmith, which we're to understand is a small town outside of a larger city, which is called Iron City. So these are important little features, Mm -hmm. Blacksmith and Iron City. Mm -hmm. In Blacksmith, there's a small college called College on the Hill, also a very important name, which should have certain resonances with probably some of your listeners, Mm -hmm. College on the Hill, the city on the hill. Mm -hmm. And at this college, there's a professor, the character you're just asking me about, named Jack Gladney. Jack Gladney created a program in Hitler studies, and he is considered to be one of the great experts in the world on Hitler studies, the study of Hitler and all aspects of Hitler. It's often mentioned how he will, after the family night together, he will sit deep into the night reading Mein Kampf. Mm -hmm. He's just somebody who's immersed in Mm Hitleriana. And yet his great dark secret is that he neither speaks nor understands nor reads German. And this is a kind of ongoing theme Mm -hmm. in the novel. He is, on the one hand, considered the world expert, but he's also something of a fake. He's a fraud. He's a fraud. And including the fact that as an academic, he is known as J.A.K. Gladney, which is a supposed abbreviation of his name that Mm -hmm. he just created so that he would seem more important. So it sounds British. Yeah, it sounds British. Exactly. (laughs) J.A.K. Jack Gladney. Jack is married to a woman named Babette, and they live in an old Victorian home with a porch. That's where we're in a neighborhood of Victorian homes. So it's a very traditional setting, but in which the traditionalism is, again, something of a facade because Babette and Jack, while they are married, they have four children living in their home, none of whom is their child. Right. And none of whom are actually well, Wilder. brothers or sisters. Wilder is theirs. No. It's from I a previous the little... marriage. No, oh, he really? has a brother who lives in Australia, we're told. Okay. So none of their children are their children. In fact, just this morning, I laid out their four children. So Jack has been married five times to mm-hmm. four women. His first wife is also his fourth wife. Oh, that's so right. So Dana Breedlove right. is his first wife, and they had a child who is mentioned but doesn't appear, Mary Alice. His second wife is Janet Savory, who now goes by Mother Devi, right. who lives on an ashram. Right whose son is Heinrich, Heinrich Gerhardt. So very Germanic names. Mm -hmm. And German themes are really important in this novel. And he lives with them. His third wife is Tweedy Browner, whose daughter is B, and she appears briefly on a visit in the Mm -hmm. novel, but doesn't live with them. And then he remarries Dana Breedlove a second time, so his fourth marriage to his first wife. She was the spy? Hmm? Was she the spy? She is, I think that's right. I think she's the spy. Yeah, she's the spy. Yeah. And they have a child the second time they're married named Steffi, and Steffi lives with them. Mm -hmm. And then his fifth wife is Babette. And Babette has two children living with them, but three children were told of. A child, Denise, who we don't know the father, at least as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. And then a son, Wilder, who's the youngest, who lives with them, again, whose name is significant, who we're told has a brother, Eugene, who lives in Australia. So we have a family of Uh half-siblings and step-siblings, two of each. So two step-siblings for each family. Mm -hmm. Each one has two step and two half-siblings in this Mm -hmm. family. So the very traditional family 
is anything but traditional. Right. In fact, it's kind of the opposite of traditional in some respect. And yet they're also traditional. And since they're a nuclear family, they have family nights, although the family nights are spent in front of the television mm -hmm. watching TV on Friday mm -hmm. nights. So that's the backdrop of the story. What happens in the story is really a lot of talk, a lot of conversation. Some of it's just uproariously funny. And then two main other events, the airborne toxic events. So there's the train wreck in which they spend a day or several days trying to escape from this menacing cloud in which Jack is exposed and now understands that he's probably going to die from this exposure, which they will have a better idea whether he dies in approximately 30 years. So right. probably around the time he's going to die anyway. Right, right, right. And then the last section of the book, but a theme throughout the book, is Babette's efforts to procure a pharmaceutical that is not on the market called Dilar which is supposed to, or the aim is to relieve the person who takes it from their fear of death. Right. And both Babette and Jack are just petrified, kind of share this profound fear of death. And death is really a main theme that hovers over this novel. Yeah, I mean, the kind of existential mm -hmm. angst that runs through it. Yeah. In fact, the working title of the book, before DeLillo named it White Noise, was The American Book of the Dead. Really? Yeah. And you notice in the book several times the Egyptian Book of the yes. Dead and the Tibetan Book of the Dead are mentioned. Yes. So he wanted to write this as the American Book of the Dead. Oh, well, that's really interesting. Yeah, which would be a different title, not place a different emphasis. But well, he did see this as, if not the main theme, certainly close to the main theme. Well, that's actually a really, and I will have to think a lot about that because one, why didn't he name it that? Mm -hmm. But also that colors the way that at least I would read the novel and especially the end of the novel, but we'll get there yeah. in a bit. So yeah, I mean, in terms of plot, there's actually not that much going on until the yeah. third section. Yeah. The third section gets a little plot heavy yeah. and weird. Yeah. But I think the first section of the novel is just getting to know these people. And I think DeLillo portrays them in a lovingly satirical way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, they're... There's an absurdity to yes. all of it. The Hitler studies mm -hmm. and the scenes in the supermarket where they're having these long conversations between professors about everything from fear of death to how Elvis was like Hitler. And mm -hmm. there's all this deeply hilarious things. And we're getting to know the family. I think one question that I have about this novel is how the action of the novel is actually related to the themes of the novel, because it seems important that those would be intimately bound mm -hmm. up, but it's also not obvious, yeah. right? Because the kind of white noise that pervades the first section of the novel is really interesting, but somewhat clear. But then we get this toxic airborne event, which is cataclysm, right? Mm -hmm. This different kind of danger. Yeah, it is a cataclysm, but it's not clear because nobody knows what it actually does to people. There's discussion and all this sort of speculation on what it does to laboratory rats and whether that happens to human beings. Mm -hmm. And again, it's absurd and it's funny, and the speculation and sometimes the quasi-scientific claims about what this gas will do to people. But in the end, it's pretty funny because Jack, who is at least momentarily exposed to this gas, is told that he will die from it, that mm -hmm. death has entered him, as I think the phrase goes, mm -hmm. but that they will know whether and what ways it will affect him in about 30, 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So in other words, I think the toxic airborne event is just one form and one maybe dramatic representation of all of the stuff that enters us, that's constantly inundating us in the form of waves or radiation or consumer products, that everything is... I won't dwell on the scene, but there is a funny scene where Babette and Jack talk about entering, and she hates, oh, yeah. she hates yes. the phrase to be entered. Yes. yes, okay. <laughs> but that's important because she's talking about it in a sexual way. But the whole novel, in a way, is about how everything is entering us from these outside sources. Mm -hmm. Notice there's one scene where the New York emigres, who are professors at the College on the Hill, who are in the Department of American Lifestyles, I think it's called, sort of American Studies. Mm -hmm. One of them says, we live in two places, home and television. Those are the two places we live. Mm -hmm. We live in home and we live in television. And the book in many ways shows us how much home in the Gladney family 
is really lived in and through the television. Like mm -hmm. a lot of the family's interactions are mediated and seen or understood through their relationship to the television. So you're saying, imagine now the way in which we read this novel written in 1985 and thinking about the technology that pervades us now. Well, we've only experienced this even further degree with the cell phones and the internet mm -hmm. and so forth. So the idea that the home, which used to be in some ways seen as a kind of bastion from the world, the haven in the heartless world, as uh, Christopher Lash wrote in that book, is actually completely pervaded by waves and radiation from outside the home. So the airborne toxic event is just the most dramatic representation of the way that the most sacrosanct supposedly insulating institution where you're able to raise your children to reflect your values and have your beliefs actually is not the space we, the people who form that space, that we control at all. It's actually mm -hmm. in some ways the constantly being bombarded or entered by all these other forces. I mean, it's interesting that you think it's the home that maybe is the locus of concern for DeLillo or just the novel I'm maybe a little bit skeptical. I mean, I agree with everything that you just said that, yeah, the home can't stop the white noise from entering in. And of course, that problem is also only worse now, mm -hmm. right? Every parent ever will tell you the battle of the screens is constant, creating any kind of home life that's not mediated through apps or tablets. Mm -hmm. I mean, even getting kids to all gather around yeah. the television now right. is something of a miracle. No, it's funny. I think <laughs> in 1985, this was, again, meant satirically, that family night was sitting in front of the television yeah. watching airplane crashes. Yeah. And then after which Jack would read Hitler deep into the night. But now it seems almost nostalgically quaint, yes, the idea that the family is going to gather together again around one screen. I know. <laughs> right? But I think at the time it was intended, again, satirically. Just to complete my thought, though. Is it really the home or is it the individual that feels threatened? That's really my question, because to go back to the scene that you're talking about, she doesn't want to think of her husband as entering her, right? Mm. She's like, I'm not an elevator. Right. Yeah. And the way that the members of this family are kind of isolated from one another, especially, I mean, we look most closely at the husband and the wife mm -hmm. and the ways in which they keep secrets and are possibly leading different lives. I mean, I just kind of wonder if it's the individual that is the locus of concern for DeLillo. I think in many ways, I've actually read this book in a lot of ways through the lens of Alexis de Tocqueville. It won't surprise listeners who know my academic interests. And I think there are a lot of elements of this book that reflect very Tocquevillian themes. And sometimes I think this book is a dramatization of volume two of Democracy in America, the trends or tendencies of America. And it's worth noting that. Do you want to just say what those themes are sure. for our listeners? Yeah. I mean, I would just say in the first place that DeLillo, he understands himself. He's described himself as attempting to understand the American mystery. That's actually a quote that he sees America as a kind of mystery that needs to be understood. And I think a little bit like Tocqueville, he sees it as something of an outsider. It's worth noting, and I think it's an important fact biographically, DeLillo is the child of Italian immigrants and grew up in an Italian neighborhood of the Bronx. His parents owned an Italian bakery on 187th Street in the Bronx. He went to Catholic schools his entire life, went to diocesan schools as a primary in high school and then went to Fordham University as a college student. I wouldn't describe him as a Catholic, and yet I think you can see really Catholic themes that pervade this book, including, of course, a really uproariously interesting and funny in its way dialogue that he has with nuns at the end of the book. Yes, and so I definitely yes, want to talk, talk about, about that. that. Yes, yes. Yeah. Really important, of course, one of the last scenes of the book. But I think in interesting ways, DeLillo understands himself and sees himself as something of an outsider, as do many of the children of Catholic immigrants, as kind of someone looking in to an America, as someone who doesn't fully belong in an America quite yet, maybe unlike our children, our children's children's generation mm -hmm. who feel completely Americanized. He grew up in a home that he said in which Italian and English were spoken sometimes simultaneously. So he has a little bit of an outsider status. So I think he has that kind of Tocquevillian 
distance from America mm-hmm. and his effort to understand it. So I think one of the themes that is clearly in this book is precisely individualism. And one of the spaces that Tocqueville suggests is the place of resistance against this tendency is the family. The family mm-hmm. and the relationships of the family is one of the loci of resistance toward the individualization of Americans. And yet it seems that in lots of ways, the particular family, and I think he's writing about the American family writ large in lots of ways, is very fragile. Mm -hmm. So imagine growing up in a home in which you have no natural brothers or sisters, full brothers or sisters, in which your mother and father have no children of their own, and in which you, if you're Jack's children, you know he's married to and living with his fourth wife, fifth marriage. Mm -hmm. How fragile that is. And I think every American growing up in a family today, whether it's your family or families that you know, recognize the fragility of the family. So this space that in many ways is supposed to be a main point of resistance toward the fragmentation of America is actually almost, you could say, the perfect portrait of a kind of fragmentation. And then add to that the television, the role of the television, the fragmentation of the discussion, the discourse of the family. There are just amazingly, uproariously funny scenes. I think the funniest scenes in the novel are the conversations that are had Mm -hmm. between members of the family in which one person will say something like, what is Dylar? And then the next person will say, you mean where the girl living next door is? Mm -hmm. No, that's Dakar. Is that where camels come from? Camels have two humps, right? Or one hump. Well, if it's two humps, it means they carry food and water. Isn't that llamas? Where are llamas from? They're from Chile. Don't you mean Vicuna? I mean, it's, the whole conversation yeah. is this constant stream of consciousness mm-hmm. in which the successor sentence bears no relation to the preceding sentence. Mm-hmm. So I think the fragmentation is a deep and pervasive theme in this. And I have to think that DeLillo is both like a kind of Tocquevillian here, recognizing a deep fact and truth about American society in significant part because he came from a different world, a world of really strong family and communal ties in that Italian-American neighborhood, the way he talks about his grandparents and his parents Mm -hmm. together, multi-generational home, very traditional, Mm -hmm. comes from a very traditional Catholic background. He himself is not a practicing Catholic as far as I know. And yet I think this is really one of the great Catholic novels Mm -hmm. of the 20th century. I read it as a Catholic novel because I think it's pervaded by Catholic themes. Okay, well, I definitely want to tease out more of that. I mean, I do wonder about the psychology of a person who has had four failed marriages and Mm -hmm. keeps going. Yeah. (laughs) And created Hitler studies and (laughs) this identity of J.A.K. Gladney. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's something just mysterious and also lovable about that kind of person. It's like, what's the need there? Is it just to not be alone? Or is it honestly to think I can make it work this time. Well, I think this reflects another theme of Tocqueville, which is the American quality of restlessness. This is another theme that pervades the book, the inability, in a sense, to be still, the Mm -hmm. inability to feel contentment or satisfaction, the idea that there's always something else to do, something else to be done. So you see it, obviously, in the family formation. I would have to assume the reason for these constantly failed marriages, as they're called, is somehow this particular woman, this particular marriage, this is not satisfying to me. I'm going to go try something else on for size. So mm-hmm. this is almost like seeing marriage as a fashion that I can take this piece of clothing off and put on another piece of clothing. I'm going to go back to the first piece of clothing I have and remarry the first wife and then have a succession of children from these marriages. The supermarket image, I think viewing marriage in this light is reflective of a consumerist mindset, which isn't just about products. It's also about our relationships. It infects the deepest element of what it is that makes a human being. And this is very much the way that Tocqueville describes restlessness in the American context. The constant belief and fear is constantly a kind of both desire and a fear that something better may lie around the corner. And if I stay where I am, I'm going to miss out on what's just over the horizon. So this impermanence, this inability to find satisfaction. And I think ultimately this contributes to this pervasive fear and concern about death. And this is something that Tocqueville describes in his chapter on restlessness, right? That part of what this restlessness lies in is this belief that somehow if we can gather enough stuff, if we can do enough things, somehow we'll escape the end of all activity, death itself. And this is a theme in the novel that if you just do enough, if you Mm -hmm. gain enough experience, like even studying Hitler is that which will protect us from death. So I think this book is a very 
Tocquevillian analysis of features of America that you could say are broadly features of modernity, that Delilo is portraying in an extremely funny way, but I don't take it that he's portraying it in an entirely sympathetic way at all. Yeah, I mean, it's not that his characters are lovable, but not super sympathetic. No, you right? I mean, want to model your life on Jack Gladney. No, for sure. But I think for us as people who have spent our entire adult lives in higher ed. You recognize the type. We recognize all <laughs> sure. of them, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. All of them instantiate something that we're very familiar with. But I want to talk more about the connection between the restlessness and the irrepressible thoughts of death and the kind of all-consuming fear of death that they both seem to suffer equally from. They're constantly discussing who's going to die first. And they both tell each other that I want to die before you die. Right. And that this actually turns out not to be true. Right. They're lying yeah. to each other. Right. They are. Right. <laughs> Even they, though they claim to always tell each other absolutely everything. Right. Which, of course, the they don't. No. Of course, they don't. And Babette, in particular, has a very dark secret mm -hmm. that she's keeping from her husband that is related to her fears of death. But before we get to that, I mean, this connection between restlessness and fear of death, one thing that Babette at least says over and over again is she's like, I never want it to end. Mm -hmm. And she also says she never wants Wilder to grow up. He is the anchor grounding her. And one thing that was never really clear to me is why they're so afraid of death mm -hmm. because you almost wonder what are they holding on to right they are not religious people they are very secular people so they don't have the fear of death that they're going to hell mm -hmm. they just simply fear not existing mm -hmm. but given all of the dangers i mean there's nothing obvious about their life that you would think Oh, right. I would want that forever. Yeah. So why Other are they so itself. resistant yeah. to any kind of stopping point? Yeah. So you asked me a few minutes ago about the plot of the novel, and I made a mental note to come back to that because the word plot is constantly being yes, mentioned it is. in this yes. novel. Mm -hmm. Almost every time the word plot is mentioned, it has several valences. So one way it's constantly used is sort of the plot of a novel. And several times during the novel, one character or another says that all plots move deathward, mm -hmm. right? so that every plot moves toward death. It's interesting that, spoiler alert, this novel does end with an attempted murder, but it doesn't come off. So mm -hmm. the plot does seem to move in the trajectory of death, that somebody's going to die. But in fact, in the novel, as far as I can tell, as far as I remember, only one person dies and it's not anybody we meet in the novel. It's the sister of Mr. Treadwell, who I bet goes and reads National Enquirer right. newspaper articles right. to. It's just a brief mention. So there's not a lot of death. There's a lot of fear of death in this novel, but there's not a lot of death. So all plots move deathward. And then there's another meaning of plot, which is, of course, plotting, to plot, to scheme. And part of what this novel is about is whether or not one can scheme one's way to a condition in which one no longer fears death. So Babette plots, she has a plot and she reveals mm -hmm. her plot to Jack at some point. She sleeps with one of the scientists who creates this pill, Dilar, mm -hmm. and that's supposed to relieve her of her fear of death, mm -hmm. which it does not. Mm -hmm. And Jack plots, and in fact is told and encouraged by Murray toward the end of the book that one who plots is able in some ways to escape death. That if you can actually kill someone, if you can plot to kill someone, that gives you credit to be someone who's no longer a dyer. You can be a killer or a dyer mm. is the claim of this friend, supposedly. Which of friend. course makes no sense. It makes no all. sense, right. <laughs> but there is a really interesting, another appearance of plot in the book that goes almost unnoticed. And I mentioned it to you last night. You asked me, is there any scene I wanted to spend mm -hmm. a little bit of time on? I said, yeah, there's a scene where Jack goes to a cemetery. And it's very right. brief. It's yeah. very brief. It's right at the end of the first section. Yeah, so where is that? So it's on page 97. Okay. And it's the very last two pages of the first section, Waves and Radiation. And it's really interesting because in the same way you have this at least image of the traditional home 
the Victorian homes, the old little college town, the college on the hill, you have this brief mention of this burial ground. It's called Old Burying Ground. So it's something like from the colonial days. Mm -hmm. And its location on the sign is Blacksmith Village. So this was once the village of Blacksmith. We know of another village, or another mention of village in the novel, by the way, which is the shopping mall. Mm -hmm. which is right off the expressway, mm -hmm. which is called Mid-Village Shopping Mall, so which is anything but a village any longer. It's just on an expressway. This burial ground, Jack is inspired to go there in a pensive moment. He's dropped his daughter off at the airport, and he stops there, and it's really striking because he looks at the headstones, and he notes that there's hardly a sign that anyone has preceded him in this century. So no one goes to visit or very few people go to visit this little cemetery off of the expressway. And then he says something else. I was beyond the traffic noise, the intermittent stir of factories across the river. So at least in this, they'd been correct, placing the graveyard here, a silence that had stood its ground. I don't know if this is the only mention of the word silence, but it might be in a mm -hmm. book called White Noise. Mm -hmm. So I think this is really a significant moment in the novel in which this novel, which is all about noise and inundation mm -hmm. and constant sort of invasion from these external things, this is a place of silence. So he breathes deeply, he remains in his spot, he seeks a kind of peace. And then this is how the chapter concludes. The power of the dead is that we think they see us all the time. The dead have a presence. Is there a level of energy composed solely of the dead? They are also in the ground, of course, asleep and crumbling. Perhaps we are what they dream. And then this is the last line. May the days be aimless. Let the seasons drift. Do not advance the action according to a plan. So while Jack is in the cemetery, he experiences silence and he experiences the absence of plot in the first two meanings of the word. Mm -hmm. This is a place where you can be aimless, mm -hmm. to let things rest, to be still, mm -hmm. not to be restless. Mm -hmm. And it is a plotless place. But notice, it's also a place of plots. So it's this place where... Not that all plots move deathward. This is a place where all deaths move toward a plot, mm -hmm. a place in the ground. Mm -hmm. Here's my thesis anyway. Let me try this on. My thesis is that the cemetery and moments in this book are call to our mind that in the world of white noise, in the world of the bazaar and the supermarket and the family that's really kind of fragmented in lots of ways, it's very difficult to have any experience of memory, that memory is a major theme of this book. Hmm. What do we find out is the effect of Dilar, which is supposed to cure us of our fear of death? Well, it does do something to us, which is not to cure us of our fear of death. It leads to memory loss. This is a big problem that Babette's daughter, Denise, is constantly talking about. Mm -hmm. Babette keeps forgetting, and clearly mm -hmm. she's having problems mm -hmm. remembering. So Dilar is one of the things, the modern technologies, is one of the things that literally leads to our inability to remember, a loss of memory. The airborne toxic event also has its side effects. It may or may not kill Jack, but it does have an immediate side effect that we're told of, which it gives us false memories. Right. Everyone, they set up deja vu centers. Again, one right. of the really funny moments of this right. novel. Deja vu centers where people can go and talk about the memories that they didn't have. So this is a world in which we have constantly false memories, Things that didn't happen. So think of all the stuff you watch on whatever YouTube or Instagram. Imagine our kids spending their entire lives in this world in which they think their memories are things that never happened to them. Mm -hmm. I remember this video where I saw this or that. So it's constant false memories and no memory or very difficult to remember things that have happened to you, in part because very few things increasingly happen to you. Where does a fear of death come from? Part of what I think the Tocquevillian analysis, and I think maybe DeLillo's, is a place that can't remember, is a place for which death is terrifying. Death is always, you know, we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. But the idea that nothing and no aspect of us will be remembered, in which where our plot, the plot where we end up, will not be visited, in which the families that we have will be scattered to the winds, in which the lives that we live will have no memorial, that's terrifying. It's terrifying to live in a society in which your life is like a gas cloud that disperses. It's gone. There's no memory. And then add to that the absence of a kind of religious dimension, at least in the kind of traditional form. I think there's some reason to think that this is a portrayal of us. This is a portrayal of the modern human being, mm -hmm. kind of a really bright, exaggerated way. Can I ask you, there's a lot to think about there. I mean, 
I agree that this scene is surely very important because it is one of the only spaces of solitude and contemplation. What's characteristic of contemplation is that it's a kind of rest where you're just Mm -hmm. beholding whatever it is that you're contemplating. And in the Catholic intellectual tradition, it's understood. (laughs) Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's a kind of, I mean, heaven is a Mm -hmm. kind of activity that is rest, Mm -hmm. right? Where you're resting in the good. And that's ultimately what your fulfillment or your satisfaction is going to be, Mm -hmm. right? Resting in the truth, resting in the good, finally possessing that. But this is not restlessness. This is solitude or contentment. How is that related to memory, I wonder? Is there any important connection between memory and solitude or contemplation? Because that is what is missing in the space of white noise, is that space of silence where you can really stop and reflect and contemplate. Maybe the most profound moment of silence and contemplation is that scene in the cemetery. And it's striking that that's, as I said already, that's the space where Jack kind of is relieved of the impulse and imperative to plot. And part of plotting is to sort of think that I control my circumstances, that I'm in control. And I think that's a big theme, especially as relates to the technological undercurrents of this Mm -hmm. novel. So I think there's a deep commentary in this novel that our technological age is born out of this belief in the human ability to control right. all of our circumstances. Right. And of course... Which we cannot. Right, well, it's Cartesian, it's Baconian, it's the yes. belief of the human mastery and control yes. of nature. Yes. So when you have an accident that leads to the airborne toxic event, that's a kind of confrontation with the fact that we can't control even our own technology, that our technology mm-hmm. has these side effects. If we go back to someone like Descartes or Bacon, a major part of what they thought would be the ultimate fruit of the technological project was not to cure us of the fear of death. It was to cure us of death, that the ultimate success of the modern technological project would be to overcome our mortality. This is one of the feats that seems to be achieved in Bacon's New Atlantis. So it's a very interesting little twist that in the novel the technological form of this desire to cure us of death isn't to make us immortal, it's to cure us of our fear of death, that Mm -hmm. this would be. So in a sense, as it's described a few times, to render us a bit like animals that we are ignorant of our own demise and therefore not troubled by it. There's another really great key moment in this book, and it's interesting because it's a conversation between Jack and a scientist. This is the scientist who's a professor on the College on the Hill, Mm -hmm who seems to be the only genuine academic in the place, as Mm -hmm. far as I can tell, Mm -hmm. not the professor of Hitler studies who can't read German and Mm -hmm. and seems indifferent to the question of whether Hitler was evil or not. You know, it's really about Mm -hmm. Hitler's relationship to his mother Mm -hmm. is one of the main topics, or Hitler compared to Elvis. So he goes to the scientist colleague in order to ask her what Dilar is and what it's supposed to do. And she basically discerns this has something to do with the centers of the brain that create fear, especially fear of our own demise, fear of danger. And Jack admits to wanting to understand more and even possibly procure his own quantities of dial art. And this is what the scientist says. So this is now the sort of heir of the Baconian Cartesian project. Her name is Winnie. She says the following. This is on page 228. I don't know what your personal involvement is with this substance, she said, but I think it's a mistake to lose one's sense of death, even one's fear of death. Isn't death the boundary we need? Doesn't it give a precious texture to life, a sense of definition? You have to ask yourself whether anything you do in this life would have beauty and meaning without the knowledge you carry of a final line, a border or a limit, a border or a limit. Now, this Mm -hmm. is a novel. It's all about the absence of borders. Mm -hmm. It's all about everything floating freely, Mm -hmm. waves and radiations. Mm -hmm. And you have this character who's the scientist, who's supposed to be the heir of the project Mm -hmm. that allows us to transcend all limits and boundaries and borders, who states this deep truth. I think, again, I would say it's a classical truth. You find it in the classical tradition. I wrote my dissertation on the Odyssey. I think it's Odysseus's embrace of his mortality. I think it is in the Catholic tradition that it is the fact of our death that gives, in some ways, the deepest meaning to our life. And one can discover that, and people have discovered that through contemplation. But I also think we discover that in the kinds of communities and through the kinds of relationships in which it's with our shared lives together and the memories that we carry of those who have preceded us. And part of the Catholic faith is all about litany of the saints, remembering the dead. At the end of every 
one part of the mass. You call to mind the dead. Mm -hmm. So this is a world in which in the desire to overcome all limits and to allow everything to pervade everything else, the one thing that seems in some ways incapable or that seems to be incapable for the people who inhabit it is to think about death as something other than something utterly terrifying mm -hmm. because they've ceased to recognize the deeply human and humanizing aspect of limits and borders and boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. By the way, just one last thing. After Winnie says this, he says something along the lines of, you're my true enemy. Mm -hmm. You're not a fair weather friend. You are my true enemy. Something right. along those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she does represent, in a way, a threat to the world that Jack yeah. inhabits and lives in. Yeah, that's really good. I love that. But we have to, speaking of Catholic themes, we have to talk about the nuns. There's yes. this kind of really weird unexpected, almost like Grand Inquisitor kind of moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll let you describe it. Sure. So, yeah, it's a really remarkable moment. So the novel moves, its plot moves to this ending in which Babette reveals that she has slept with this man who provides her with the Dylar, mm -hmm. supposedly relieving her of her fear of death, which it doesn't do. Jack now wants two things. He wants to procure Dylar for himself, and he wants to kill this man in part because Murray has encouraged him to think that by killing him, he himself won't die. Or he'll he has be multiple with. So motives he has for multiple killing moments. this man. So there are lots of plots yeah. going on in Jack's final scene. Those of you who watched the movie, by the way, I think it's an important fact and a real mistake of the movie or kind of real failure of the movie that in the movie, it portrays Babette coming into the hotel room where Jack confronts mm -hmm. the scientist, and that doesn't happen. So not only does Babette have her secret which she does reveal to Jack about her infidelity. Jack has his secret, which yep. is that Babette doesn't know that he attempts to kill the man who right. she slept with. So they both have their secrets and their plots. So he goes to the hotel. He finds out where this fellow is. He's trying to get all this information about him. He shows up. He's been given a gun by his father-in-law, a German gun, a Zumwalt. There's lots of German themes in this there book. There is. Yeah, which is really interesting to think about because I think there's a whole Heideggerian critique of technology going on. There's lots of German stuff in here. It'd be fun to tend tease that out. And he goes to the hotel and he keeps talking about the plot and the plan. I will shoot him in the viscera three times for maximum pain. He has three bullets. And then I will put the gun in his hand, take the dialar, walk back to my car, escape, drive back, leave this car that he's stolen from his neighbor. No one will ever know. Well, he does kind of what he says he does, but he shoots him only twice doesn't kill him, puts the gun in the guy's hand, is himself then shot by the guy. Yes. They're both now <laughs> bleeding from gun yes. wounds. And then suddenly being shot, he's awoken from his slumber, his immoral slumber, and he drives the man in Iron City. This is taking place not in Blacksmith, but Iron City. He drives through Iron City looking for a hospital and eventually sees a neon cross above a building. So he pulls in there and it turns out it's a hospital that is staffed by nuns, right. German, nuns German nuns, right, who still speak German. Mm -hmm. And it's here that this last scene in the book or penultimate scene in the mm -hmm. book unfolds. Do so you want to talk about the penultimate scene? Yeah, to... I mean, the nuns break character in a way and are like... It is their character. Well, yes, but I mean, they break the character of the nun, the, nun, the archetype. Yeah. Yeah. And... So one has to imagine that John DeLillo was educated in part by nuns, as uh -huh. one would have been. So he knows nuns. Right. And in a way, I think he's hearkening back to something he probably experienced, and I probably would have to admit having experienced myself as a cradle Catholic, which a lot of Catholic education at the time were similar ages, not dissimilar church probably formation. A lot of what learning about Catholicism was external, was a more of an external faith, how to pray, how mm -hmm. to behave. It was almost the opposite. It was the inversion of Luther. It was acts. Mm -hmm. and not faith in a mm -hmm. way. I mean, the mm -hmm. faith was there, but I think there was a kind of idea that if you performed enough of these mm -hmm. external acts, you could internalize the faith. Mm -hmm. but I think in contrast to those, maybe who, like yourself, perhaps converted to Catholicism under the influence of theologians like JP II and Benedict XVI, the theological dimension of the faith just wasn't as evident to those in the pews right. as it is, I think, for many now. It wasn't right. as intellectual a faith. Mm -hmm. So I think these nuns reflect something of maybe DeLillo's experience, and then he takes us to the nth degree, which is the nuns don't actually believe right. any of it. No. 
at one point, Jack says, oh, I see you have a picture of heaven on the wall with John F. Kennedy and Pope John yeah. the 13th or something, <laughs> or 23rd. And he mm-hmm. says, oh, if you still believe in that? He finds it so comforting to think that somebody somewhere still believes in a heaven. And the nuns say, what, do you think we are stupid? You think we are dumb? Mm-hmm. We are not stupid. We don't believe in these fairy tales. We believe simply because you need us to believe. We believe because you don't believe, and you need someone to believe because you don't. So they talk about mimicking or simulating this belief in order that non-believers believe that somewhere in the world there are believers. Right. Which is, of course, it's so many levels of inversion. Right. That makes it kind of fascinating. Right. And the church is sort of this manipulative. I mean, like the church sort of only exists to keep things in line. Like you need us to be doing this. So we do this, but it's not real. I don't think it's manipulation. In fact, nothing could be further in a way off the beaten track and irrelevant to the lives of the characters in this book. No one is looking for a religion as it's traditionally understood. Now that said, There's all kinds of ways in which these people are living in the aftermath and searching for a kind of religion, right? Among other things, for example, there are two mentions of churches in this book. One of them is Babette teaches in a church basement. She teaches posture and she's going to be, she's also going to be teaching soon. She's going to start a new course on how to eat. So basic functions Mm -hmm. of human life Mm -hmm. is what she teaches in the Mm -hmm. church. And then the other church is the college chapel is where the Hitler conference is held, where Jack is embarrassingly Mm -hmm. can barely speak German Mm -hmm. and tries to avoid using any German words that also aren't English words. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's it's a Mm -hmm. hilarious moment. So there are churches, but more than that, there's all kinds of moments in this book in which there is this religious, almost epiphany. Jack, several times when he's looking at his children sleeping, he talks of it in religious language. It yeah, fills him with a sense of awe yeah, and transcendence. transcendence and yes. awe. Mm-hmm. And he uses this very religious language, he uses that language to describe the airborne toxic event, yep. the Nyadine D, yep. that it filled him with a sense of religious awe. Mm-hmm. So one of the themes that I think one finds in DeLillo's writings, especially in this book, but other of his novels that I have read, is he's really interested in where does the religious impulse go when it ceases to be contained in a religion? Mm -hmm. And that it doesn't disappear. Again, this is a very Tocquevillian theme. Tocqueville says democratic man will cease to be religious in the traditional sense, but its religious impulse will manifest itself in all kinds of ways, some of which will be very perverse Mm -hmm. and pathological Mm -hmm. and some of which will be harmless and also not really addressing the key spiritual questions of the human being. Tocqueville says human beings, in a sense, even if they deny the need to believe in a God and a transcendent and the divine, they will still in a sense, have that instinct, that desire, that desire to know the divine will remain. And the scene with the nuns, to get back to the scene with the nuns, Mm -hmm. it strikes me that here again, we have this Tocquevillian or maybe Deliloian moment in which we might say, okay, these nuns are the inversion of what a nun is. The nuns are supposed to believe, even if people around them don't believe. But the nuns believe, if everyone else found out that no one believed, the nuns state, the world would end. The world would end in a catastrophe. The world would be destroyed. There would be no more world. It is a very Dostoevskian moment. Mm -hmm. In other words, the nuns do this out of a kind of greater concern for themselves because people need to believe something. So the nuns, in a weird way, could apparently could be perfectly fine not believing. Apparently, not only do they not believe, they're fine not believing. They have no need or desire to Mm -hmm. believe. It's everyone else that has this craving and desire to believe. And that to me, is a really interesting moment in which the figures that are supposed to represent the religious institution, in a sense, are sort of the functional equivalent of a church for a world that now has no ability to articulate what its religious longings are in which those longings remain. So I'm not saying it's a satisfying sort of conclusion of this, but it is a fitting conclusion in a world that's all about how everything is a kind of simulation. The true thing always is in some ways not present in the thing mm-hmm. you think you're seeing. There's a great moment where the Jack goes to talk to one of the officials who's responding to the disaster, who's wearing an armband that says Simuvac. And Jack asks him, what is Simuvac? Well, we're in charge of simulated emergencies like this one. Right. He says, why are you here? He says, well, we're responding to this so that we'll be able to run better simulations in the future. Right? Right. So the whole purpose of the emergency is for the simulation. So in a world in which everything is in a sense simulated, the religious yearning 
achieve some kind of satisfaction through the simulated faith of the nuns. Right. And right. again, it's a very postmodern ish, right. but it's not postmodernism that dismisses kind of the deepest and permanent longings of human beings. In other words, it says there's no there there. I think Delilo is saying there is a there there and we can't go back, but we can't stay or it's going to be very difficult for us as human beings to sort of stay with what I would describe as hyper modernity. Mm -hmm. So in a way, there's a kind of question about if there is a post modernity, presumably, I think for Delilo ought not to be the continuation and acceleration of the hyper modernity he describes in this novel. So I think he leaves us with this really interesting conundrum that we're all <laughs> we're all struggling I with. Think, What's I next? I think he does. And this is going to be our final thoughts because we need to get you to your next event. But he does end the novel, one, in the supermarket, but two, with this kind of longing for transcendence. And it is simply watching of a sunset. So this is page 324. They're just going to watch the sunset. Mm -hmm. There is anticipation in the air, but it is not the expectant midsummer hum of a shirt sleeve crowd, a sandlot game with coherent precedence, a history of secure response. This waiting is introverted, uneven, almost backward and shy, tending towards silence. Oh, there's another silence. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What else do we feel? Certainly there is awe. It is all awe. It transcends previous categories of awe. But we don't know whether we are watching in wonder or dread. We don't know what we are watching or what it means. We don't know whether it is permanent, a level of experience to which we will gradually adjust and to which our uncertainty will eventually be absorbed or just some atmospheric weirdness mm. soon to pass. Right. Yeah. And then there are befuddled people in mm -hmm. the supermarket. Yeah. So final question, final thought. Where is he landing? Is it just in this space of I recognize the need, but I have no idea what to do with it? Or is it something else? I can't help but think that I called it a kind of Catholic novel. It's a Catholic novel of a lapsed Catholic who I think at some level both is grateful to have transcended the world he came from, a, probably a fairly narrow Italian-American neighborhood in the Bronx that is not unfamiliar to me growing up in the remnants of an Irish Catholic enclave in Connecticut and wouldn't be unfamiliar to people of that generation who immigrated. So grateful to, in some senses, have gotten out of that. I'll be the first to acknowledge that if I had grown up in Ireland, probably would be farming potatoes or something. I wouldn't be a full professor at the University of Notre Dame. That's, for me, gratifying mm -hmm. that I have had this opportunity. And yet the very thing, the very features and qualities of modern America that in one way make that possible also eviscerate the world that someone like a Delilo came from and replace it with this impermanence and fragmentation and the invasion of all of these waves and radiation and a consumer mindset that even affects marriage and one's relationship with children and spouses. So I think it ends with this beautiful, in some ways, passage, which is frankly about the remnants of the Naya D&D and its effect on the sunset, right? Mm -hmm. That is that which causes the most awe and transcendence yeah. is also that which is in some ways the most terrifying or at right. least one piece of evidence for that which is most terrifying, which is our inability to control our technological plotted world. So I think maybe like all great novels, you know, maybe in this novel in particular, a great a novelist who's really thinking deeply about this condition is not necessarily giving us answers, but it's certainly pointing to the maybe irresolvable conundrum of what it is to be a human in the modern world. I hope leaving us unsatisfied with it, but not thinking that we have any easy answers to that. Yeah. Well, this was both delightful and profound. So thank you Good. so much for coming yeah. on and sharing my, your thoughts. My pleasure. Yeah, it was fun to talk about. I haven't we read this book in a long time, so I was glad to do so. Yeah, it was really fun. You have been listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a podcast hosted by the Honors College at the University of Tulsa. To learn more about the Honors College, please go to our website, utulsa.edu slash honors. To learn more about this podcast, you can check out its website, sacredandprofanelove.com. On the website, you'll find an archive of all our past episodes and guests, and also a blog where we post news related to the work that we do. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter, where our handle is at Pod. 
finally, if you would like to support this podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod. Patrons receive podcast swag and subscriptions with our literary partners, The Point Magazine, Switchyard Magazine, and The Lamp Magazine. We are grateful to our partners for their ongoing support.